We have some new and exclusive information in this video that we wanted to start off with. We recently translated an interview from the 124th issue of the Japanese magazine Nintendo Dream. This issue featured an interview about The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap between Eiji Aonuma, who acted as the game's supervisor, and Hidemaro Fujibayashi, who directed the game over at Capcom, and who would ultimately join Nintendo to work on future Zelda games. The interview has some interesting facts that have never been posted anywhere else, including how the character Ezlo was basically made to avoid past mistakes. When Capcom were working on the Oracle of Ages and Seasons, they lacked a character that could explain things to the player, which put them at a disadvantage. Fujibayashi elaborated, At the time that we were making the Oracle games, we really struggled with the lack of a character like Navi in Ocarina of Time that could explain the situation. So, from the beginning, we had decided there would be a companion character on the next adventure. Although Ezlo was added to conform to what worked in past Zeldas, Ezlo's design challenged some series conventions. It's pointed out in the interview that the green-pointed hat is an iconic feature of Link, and trying to alter that might have been met with resistance by Nintendo. However, that wasn't the case. Alnuma explained, Since Ezlo's mouth only appears when the hat is talking, they said it was no problem. The interview also brings up how Zelda games like Majora's Mask and Wind Waker seem to have moved away from having large amounts of dungeons to explore in favor of a more detailed overworld. And something that adds depth outside of the dungeons in Minish Cap is the Kinstone system. Aonuma was so impressed with how Kinstones motivated players to fully explore new areas that he proclaimed, I think this new system will be a cornerstone of upcoming Zelda games. Despite his enthusiasm, the Kinstone system has yet to return to Zelda. Minish Cap's Hyrule Town is a fairly dense and bustling area in the center of the game's world, which led to the interviewer asking if Hyrule Town was inspired by Majora's Mask Clock Town. But Aonuma shot that down by saying, no, it's its own thing. But immediately after, Fujibayashi follows up by saying, we had talked about making a game that stays just in town for a while. Interestingly, Fujibayashi said earlier in the interview that they originally wanted Link to wear all kinds of different masks and hats, but this was reduced in scope to Link having a single hat that could talk. So the Minish Cap was originally a game that made players stay in a central town for a while and had tons of different masks to wear. Sounds like in its early stages, Minish Cap was more like a 2D Majora's Mask. We have more exclusive trivia coming up later in the video, so stick around for that. One other big adventure on the Game Boy Advance featured Nintendo's main man, Mario, in Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. The game kicks off with a normally unlosable battle against Bowser, with the key word there being normally. Bowser only causes 1 HP of damage to Mario per turn, and since Mario has 10 HP, and Bowser will tap out after 5 turns, there's normally no way for Mario to lose all of his health. But if the game is hacked to reduce Mario's HP to 5 or lower at the battle's start, the player will be able to lose. And as it turns out, losing doesn't take the player to the game over screen, so they'll just be softlocked in this battle until they reset their GBA. This would change in the very next Mario RPG, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which will at least give the player a game over screen should they fail in their unlosable battle against Lord Crump. Although this soft lock in Mario & Luigi is one that you can only achieve via hacking, some other locks in the game are remarkably easy to trigger. For example, players can perform a high jump on top of Mini Mario while having Mario hit Luigi mid-jump, which normally gives the player a coin. However, if this is done in the fourth boss room in Bowser's castle, it will instantly eradicate the brothers instead, and force the player to reset their game. A similar lock can occur when standing next to an NPC on a ledge. If Small Mario and the High Jump skill are selected, then the player presses B, A, and then right, Mario will fall off the ledge, with an agonized-looking Luigi left above, unable to move. Once again, the only solution to this is for the player to reset their game. Some soft locks can even occur without any input from the player themselves. If the player performs a set of bros attacks correctly, Mario will get an idea to do an advanced bros attack, illustrated with a little thinking animation. If this occurs in the battle against the Huhuros boss, while the boss is also using the thinking animation, the game will get stuck in a state where it doesn't consider it to be anybody's turn. So Mario, Luigi, and Huhuros will continue to just stare at one another in perpetuity. 
As we've mentioned previously on the show, Nintendo did once own the Banjo IP, but it left along with Rare with Microsoft's acquisition of the company. And Nintendo planned on publishing Grunty's Revenge prior to the acquisition. A small relic of this can be seen in the game's data, an unused Nintendo logo that would have appeared in the game's introduction. But the game has some unseen properties that are far more impressive. The game is quite a unique creation for the handheld, as while it may be a top-down 2D platformer, the areas in which the player walks were created with full 3D collision crafted out of blocks and wedges to carefully and accurately allow for 3D platforming on the handheld. This no doubt helped the games feel a little bit more like their N64 predecessors than it would have without. During gameplay, this 3D element to the game can easily be missed, as it is never directly presented to the player. Another piece of a game that's easy to miss is a certain bit of AI behavior for the units in Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising. Every unit that the enemy builds during combat is assigned one of seven different AI types, with each individual unit being differently weighted to have a particular behavior assigned to it, and each pre-deployed unit spawned at the mission start has a pre-assigned type already. AI Type 1's goal is to target the enemy HQ, 2's goal is to escort infantry and lander units, 3's goal is to capture properties, 4's goal is to act aggressively, 5's goal is to act defensively, and 7's goal is to protect the enemy HQ. These are all implemented and functional in-game. You might be wondering why we didn't mention AI Type 6. Well, AI Type 6 has a 0% chance of being assigned to any unit, and in fact is only assigned to two medium tanks in the entire game. They can be seen here in the level Drake's Dilemma, and they never interact with the player at all due to them being too far away. Although these tanks spent the entire mission dancing around in circles doing nothing, AI Type 6 is actually noticeably tougher than the average unit. The modder Kartal has done some experiments with AI Type 6, has found that they secure bases by zoning out your infantry from capturing them, and even they know when to stay back and when to cover their own infantry. It's quite remarkable that such a relatively sophisticated AI would go essentially unused for the entire game. Next up we have a fact about Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire that very few people will have actually witnessed, but before we get into that, a word from this episode's sponsor, Baiyi. If you've ever used American sites to buy things from Japan, you've probably noticed how much sellers jack up the price. It can be a lot. This is where Baiyi comes in. Baiyi is a service that places orders or bids on your behalf on Japanese shopping and auction sites, then ships the items straight to you without any absurd price hikes. This includes sites like Rakuten, Amazon Japan, and Yahoo Japan Auction. So if you've been wanting to get a hold of a Japanese game or piece of merch, but don't want to pay insane rates, this service will let you get your hands on the stuff for a more affordable price. Baiyi is easy to use and offers support in several languages, which of course includes English. They also ship worldwide, including to North America, Europe, and Oceania. Baiyi has over half a dozen international shipping methods, multiple payment methods, and four different insurance plans to match your needs. And if you're not aware, the value of the yen is very favorable to the US dollar right now, resulting in even greater savings. Baiyi is also giving Did You Know Gaming viewers a 2,000 yen first-time purchase coupon for signing up through the link below. So if you want to try out this great service and get 2,000 thousand yen off your first order, check out Baiyi using our link below. And now, back to Pokemon. In Ruby and Sapphire, it is not actually possible for the player to lose the opening battle against the Pugina that's found attacking Professor Birch near the start of the game. The offending Pugina is actually programmed to flee the fight if the player trainer somehow manages to get their Pokemon down to critical health. Speaking of rarely seen scenarios in Pokemon, Pokemon Emerald also has some unique and unintended behavior in its Japanese release. In the Japanese game, players can use Dive on the deep water tiles in Team Aqua's hideout, even though there's nothing to dive down to. This was clearly a programming oversight, as diving in the water simply teleports the player back to Petalburg City, the lowest indexed map location in the game. This error was fixed in the international release by simply disabling dive while on the tiles. This glitch isn't in any version of Ruby and Sapphire, because in those games, the entrance to the hideout is no longer accessible after obtaining the Mind Badge, which is required to use dive in the overworld. There'll be some more Pokemon facts at the end of this video, exclusive facts in fact, so be sure to stick around for those. In June 2021, it was revealed that one of the best-selling titles on the Nintendo Wii U eShop was 
Metroid Fusion, surpassed only by Metroid Zero Mission. This surge in sales for two handheld Metroid games was thanks almost entirely to the reveal of Metroid Dread in Nintendo's 2021 E3 Direct. Keep in mind, most people had already moved on from their Wii U's by 2021, so it's a pretty big deal for so many to go back and dust off their consoles. GameStop even revealed that Metroid Dread was their most pre-ordered title post E3, so it seems Metroid fans will certainly bite if the line is cast for their attention. Speaking of Metroid Fusion, there's a small but rather interesting mistake that has been observed by Spencer PK on the cutting room floor. As a result of a glitch that occurs in the game's programming, Samus's left wall jump sprites in-game for some reason do not display her left arm something that is a result of a rendering error, as internally these sprites do feature her left arm, with the issue not being demonstrated in her right wall jump sprites. Other, perhaps more prolific series from Nintendo have their own unseen or unheard portions of their data that the player may otherwise never come across. One of these is the Game Boy Advance launch title, Super Mario Advance, which has development files containing a number of voice samples for Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad. In these unused voice clips, the characters all laugh in bizarre, possibly intentionally unusual sounding ways. <laughs> <laughs> Where these clips would have been used in the final product are unknown. Nintendo would follow this up with Super Mario Advance 2, which has a couple of funky behaviors in its final release that are clearly unintended. By pressing left and select on the same frame while at Donut Plains 2 on the world map, and then warping to Yoshi's house, Mario will be taken to a version of the game's introduction cutscene, but populated by a collection of enemies with glitched graphics. This includes creatures such as Super Koopa with triangle heads, or a Pokey using Rex sprites for the head and Mega Mole sprites for its body segments. We mentioned earlier how some games can find themselves in a soft-locked state, with the only solution to resolve the issue being to reset the system. But Super Mario Advance 2 contains a sort of pseudo-lock glitch that can actually be resolved with severe perseverance. By performing a similar glitch to that previously mentioned, the player will find themselves on a graphically buggy level, which when completed will create a complete mess on the player's screen. This glitch fest will ultimately resolve itself, but not until an entire three hours have passed. This mess occurs due to an extremely long, glitched out, creating a path on the map cutscene, which takes three hours to unfold, and keeps on going even when the player is zooming around levels. But like we said, it will clear up eventually. Sometimes international revisions can drastically change the context of certain scenes, like in Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. In the original Japanese release of the game, one of the game's opening scenes involves Sid, who can be seen sitting alone in the street in a drunken state. He approaches Mute and the rest of the party as they pass by, telling them all about the wonders of alcohol, before walking back home three sheets to the wind. In the North American and European releases of the games, however, this scene is substantially different, with Sid apologizing to and being reprimanded by somebody, presumably his boss, with no dialogue making reference to his drinking. Presumably, this scene went through some revisioning, to the point of introducing a new character with their own NPC portrait as a means of trying to keep the game's E for Everyone maturity rating, demonstrating a difference between content that would have been deemed acceptable within differing regions. Mother 3 is quite well known for having gone through drastic changes during its development, having originally been created as a Nintendo 64 game before transitioning over to the GBA. The game's natural killer cyborg boss, or NK Cyborg, performs a signature attack called End of the Century Beam. With Earthbound 64 having been set to release in 1999, it seems that the End of the Century Beam was intended as a nod to the fact that the century was coming to an end in the real world around the game's original intended release, and the name simply went unchanged. One could take this information as the developers lacking a certain degree of foresight, but another fact about the game would show that they certainly weren't lacking in this department. In Chapter 2, during the cutscene that occurs just before Kumatora joins the player's party as a permanent member, she fires a PK Freeze Alpha attack on Duster and Wes as they enter the stairwell she was in, after failing to recognize who they were. 
The cutscene then plays out and she joins the team. Checking her status will reveal that she has 68 PP out of 73, 5 PP short of her maximum. PK Free's Alpha costs 5 PP to cast, meaning that the developers had considered this scene when she joins the party without a fully charged PP meter. This is just one of those small details that makes Mother 3 such a great game. We think it's about time for more exclusive GBA trivia now. A while back, we were contacted by Michelle Flitman, daughter of video game producer Mark Flitman. Mark worked on dozens of titles, including Maximum Carnage, Virtual Bart, Nightshade, Slugfest, and the game we're going to be talking about today, Dragon Ball Z Boo's Fury. After these games had finished development, Mark would keep hold of some of the production materials like concept art, design documents, and probably of most interest, early builds of games. After sorting through some of her dad's belongings, Michelle found a bag of unlabeled GBA cartridges with a few work-in-progress cards of Boo's Fury. She was kind enough to send us some images from them, along with a few tidbits about the various early builds. Some of the early content in these versions are just placeholders, like this sketch avatar, which comes from an early build of the game where many portraits seem to be scans of manga pages or reference art or this goofy-looking unfinished portrait of Goku, or even this cute cat picture that's from a build of the game where all the portraits were, well, this cat. Then there's other content like these unused early title screens that clue us in to how the game's name changed during development. One early title screen has the game's original name, Dragon Ball Z, The Legacy of Goku 3, while the second screen has the unused subtitle Dragon Ball Z Fusion. As far as we can tell, these title screens aren't documented anywhere online, and they're pretty cool to see. Mark is actually releasing a book sometime in the near future with limited-run games documenting his time in the games industry. So if you're interested in more behind-the-scenes secrets like this, look out for a book titled It's Not All Fun and Games. We have some more exclusive trivia at the end of the video, but first, some facts from one of Nintendo's most inventive sub-series. They say the best things come in threes, take note Valve, like the varying difficulties of WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, where each micro game has three varying difficulties to be played in. Interestingly, however, the game's code includes functionality to have even more difficulties than this. And through modification, it's possible to see otherwise unseen states for certain micro games. Setting the game's level over 3 in the The Brush Off micro game will result in some unseen behavior. Normally, the teeth are mildly stained on the easiest difficulty and heavily stained on the hardest difficulty, with each brush lightening the teeth until they're white. But on higher unintended difficulties, the teeth go beyond a dark brownish yellow and will become a green or even blue at the start. A mistake can also be found in WarioWare, which results in the third level to the Right in the Eye micro game being impossible to win. The game will place the eye of the needle low on the screen, making it impossible for the player's hand to be low enough to thread the needle, even if down is held the entire time. Games go through many iterations before release, and with advertising for games often starting during development, it's possible to spot changes made to the final product. Golden Sun demonstrates some of these changes in early screenshots, with some material showing that Jenna's conception as a character took place fairly late in the game's creation. Pre-release screenshots show Mia in the place that Jenna would wind up taking. Early artwork for the game also shows Mia, Garrett, and Isaac in front of Mount Aleph, with neither Jenna or Ivan being shown. Within the game's code, dummied out character positions can be found for both Felix and Sheba, though they wind up going unused and neither is playable at any point. These two characters would wind up being present in the sequel, however. Another unused playable character position can also be found dummied out for PC-07. By editing the game's save file, it's possible to reinsert these characters into the player's party, though doing so won't render any favorable results. All of them have entirely zeroed out stats with a class label of NPC. Felix and PC-07 have no small sprite, though Shiba does, but she will always face sideways. Only Felix and Shiba have a dedicated portrait for the game's status menu, with PC-07 simply displaying the last portrait seen. In battles, PC-07's portrait is visible in the status menu, showing an otherwise unused portrait of Alex. 
These unused characters will all use the Vermin Battle Sprite, but won't be capable of fighting, even if modified to have positive stat points. Unused characters are not the only parts of the game's code that go unused, with there being several synergy attacks also left in the data, though inaccessible. Some of these attacks are fully coded, status-inducing skills, which wound up never being assigned to any of the game's class's movesets, while some others indicate status effects that were also cut and never implemented. Mario Tennis Power Tour was also created by Golden Sun's development team at Camelot, which explains some of the references to Golden Sun being seen in the sport's title, such as the custom defensive power shots, which causes a giant hand to appear and catch the ball, the same giant hand used to move objects in Golden Sun. Camelot clearly also wanted to show love to another of Nintendo's franchises, though, with one of the game's NPCs saying, They say if you do a lot of practice swings, a great fairy appears to reward you. I fell for it at first, but it's a secret to everybody, if you know what I mean." Alluding to the great fairies of the Legend of Zelda series, and the extremely recognizable line, it's a secret to everybody. It turns out, though, the great fairy does appear if you practice your swing enough, though it may not be the same great fairy from the Zelda series. Some sequels weren't ever intended to be a sequel in the first place, like Mega Man Zero 4. At one stage, the game was said to be almost a completely different title altogether. Rather than continue the story where the plot of Mega Man Zero 3 had left off, Inti Creates president Takuya Aizu wanted to create something along the lines of a Mega Man Zero 1.5. This would have been an attempt to fill in the gaps to the story that occur between the first and second games in the series. Capcom, however, insisted that they instead create a true Zero Four. The main bosses of Mega Man Zero Four, the Ein Hajar Eight Warriors, were all based on mythological creatures, with their real-world mythology slotting in nicely with the game's setting. These include a fairy, a mandragora, a minotaur, a cockatrice, a pegasus, a kraken, the Norse Fenrir, and the Black Tortoise Genbu. Their connection to the game's plot comes from the Ein Hajar in Norse mythology being warriors brought to Valhalla to await Ragnarok, when they would join in an immense battle. In Zero Four, the Ein Hajar are engaging in an operation dubbed Ragnarok to eliminate the human settlement that Zero aims to protect. Another underappreciated title for the Game Boy Advance is Drill Dozer. Although it was developed by the very well-known Game Freak, it never quite hit the big leagues and just sort of stayed in Pokémon's shadow. However, this didn't stop the team from wanting to show as much love as they could for their earlier works, as well as Nintendo in general. This can be seen with unlockable alternate outfits for the game's protagonist, Jill, which are shown on the game's menu screens, though not during the main gameplay. These include schoolgirl clothes, the same outfit as that worn by the female hero in Pokémon Fire Red and Leaf Green, a pair of blue overalls that can be unlocked, which are based on Mario's signature blue dungarees and red shirt, with additional beads in her hair featuring the iconic spotted mushroom. Her futuristic clothes outfit is based on the much earlier Game Freak title Pulse Man, released for the Sega Genesis, a frog suit, which is assumed to just be based on the frog suit in Super Mario Bros. 3, and lastly, a nurse uniform based on the character Misaki Hayama, a nurse from the Japanese exclusive Game Freak title Click Plus Medic, released for the PlayStation. Ratatouille released on just about every system under the sun, but the Game Boy Advance version is easily the most interesting version of the game, having a unique mix of top-down and side-scrolling exploration. The data for the American version of the GBA release suggests that a Japanese version of the game was planned. However, because the GBA was discontinued the previous year in that country, the Japanese localization was cancelled. Another interesting secret is that several rather vulgar passwords can be found in the Game Boy Advance version's files. All of the passwords, except for BITCHK! are six characters or less, compared to the seven character passwords used for the game. Using BITCHK! won't do anything, however, making this also unused. Another set of passwords also reference various developers who worked on the game, including Bill Bullard, Jason Cruz, Juan Diaz, Eric Orr, Andrew Godzigler Ziegler, Xavier Javanek, and Michael Krentz. Some other games have secret passwords, such as Super Monkey Ball Jr. Here, passwords can be entered on the game's title screen, which also serve as 
path, Easter eggs. If the player enters the combination up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A at the title screen, the game's logo will change to say, Super Nice Try, instead of Super Monkey Ball Jr. This button combination is, of course, the Konami code. The player can also enter the combination left, left, right, right, down, down, A. This will change the logo to say Super Block Mode, which you might have guessed makes the entire game look blockier. This effect persists until the game is reset. And although it's less of an Easter egg, the player can also enter down, down, up, up, left, right, left, right, B, A, the opposite of the Konami code, to unlock everything in the game. This will change the title screen, which now says Super Enable All. Speaking of Konami Easter eggs, Castlevania Aria of Sorrow actually has an entire enemy dedicated to being nothing more than an Easter egg, the Kicker Skeleton. The enemy wears a red scarf and attacks by leaping into the air with its arms outstretched, then delivering a flying kick. These two elements reference the Japanese superhero Kamen Rider, who's known for his flying kick finishing move and his red scarf. If Soma acquires the Kicker Skeleton's soul, he'll gain a Flying Kick ability. The enemy also has a chance to drop a wearable red scarf and Ancient Belt items. The Ancient Belt alludes to the many belts that give the common riders their powers. Its description explains that it lends the wearer a positive attitude, a reference to Kamen Rider Kuga, whose belt, the Arkel, was not only an artifact from an ancient civilization, but who's also characterized by his unusually upbeat and optimistic personality. The Ancient Belt item's box-like design also mirrors Kamen Rider Black's belt, the Kingstone. Ironically, neither Kamen Rider Black nor Kamen Rider Kuga wore scarves, unlike many of the early riders. Konami clearly loves making these sorts of references. The Boktai games, for example, are overflowing with references to other Konami titles. Two solar gun frames in the original Boktai refer to games published by Konami. These are the Gradius, named after the series of side-scrolling shoot-'em-ups, and the Beatmania frames, named after Konami's series of music games. The former offers rapid shots, while the latter fires shots that make loud sounds on impact. Boktai 2 also has a sneaky reference to the Metal Gear franchise. In the game, the player can acquire the Skull Suit, which lets players sneak by enemies more effectively. In Metal Gear Solid 2, the sneaking suit worn by Raiden during the Big Shell incident was also known as the Skull Suit due to its appearance. And now it's time for our last piece of exclusive GBA trivia. Last year, we translated issue 84 of Nintendo Dream Magazine into English for the first time, and talked about some of its contents in a video all about the third generation of Pokemon games. The interview included Junichi Masuda and Ken Sugimori, and covered things like how Blaziken was designed to look ugly, and how Slackoth got motivated when it evolved into Vigoroth, then decided the effort wasn't worth it, and evolved into slacking. But there's a few more facts that we left aside just for a rainy day. One of these facts is how much the team struggled to stay motivated during development. In the interview, Masuda states that partly due to having a development team of 30, after two years, they all started to lose steam. Devs would regularly ask, how much longer till we can say we're finished? And they all had to psych themselves up for work by shouting, come on, let's do this. And the process of making the Pokemon designs themselves seems to have been demoralizing too. Sugimori mentions how a lot of the Pokemon had a troubled development. As art director, Sugimori would finalize all the Pokemon made by other members of staff so that the Pokedex was consistent. But there were points where he didn't have them all unified yet, and had to put them into playable builds mid-development. Then he'd get feedback from testers in Nintendo's Super Mario Club that the creatures didn't look like Pokemon. Sugimori said, There was a long period where I felt like, yeah, I, I know that, you don't need to keep saying it. That was pretty draining, spiritually. The basic designs were there, but they lacked polish, and the testers would point it out constantly. Did you also know that Dion Blaster from 1080 Snowboarding was originally called Leroy Blackman, or that several swears were toned down in the English release of Star Fox 64? For more N64 facts, check out the video on screen. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this in the future, and once again, thank you for watching. We super duper appreciate it.